Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. Today, we welcome Dr. Arno Delorme to Skeptico. He's here to talk about his new book, Why Our Minds Wander, Understand the Science and Learn How to Focus Your Thoughts. And Arno is super qualified to talk about this topic. He has just a stellar academic background, having published over 100 peer-reviewed papers, and he's currently a distinguished professor at University of California, San Diego right here in my backyard, which happens to be, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, really one of the top universities in the country in a lot of fields related to science and medicine. He's also an ion scientist, that is the Institute for Noetic Sciences, and I know that's an organization that many folks who are listening to this show are familiar with. And finally, since we're going to talk about consciousness and where your mind goes and what your mind is, he is a longtime meditator. So he's familiar with this topic on a personal level as well. Arno, uh, welcome to Skeptico. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So I think we should start with talking about this fine new book you have. Tell us what it's about. So it's about so um, so I um, you know I can tell this little anecdotes uh, when. Um, uh, so it's about consciousness first and why our mind wanders. So mind wandering is like you're reading a book and then you start thinking uh, about something else. And that's what we call uh, a mind wandering. And that happens when you read a book, but that also happens when uh, you're um, washing the dishes or uh, when you're meditating. So I experienced that first when I was meditating and I was mind wandering a lot. So that's why I started to study uh, my wandering, uh, you know, in my academic uh, pursuit. Also, when I started uh, almost 20 years ago, this wasn't studied at all. Now it's more popular. Uh, but yeah, that's how I became interested in, in the topic. What is mind wandering? You know, why it occurs? Can you tame your mind not to wonder? Uh, is it worth it? And, you know, what are the techniques? Uh, so, yeah, that's what the book is about. So, you know, you're just kind of dipping your toe into all sorts of uh, philosophical, metaphysical, and uh, spiritual questions when you do that. You know, I just thought you touched on it, so maybe you want to go a little bit deeper. I mean, there is a deep, deep set of knowledge, you know, locked up in these wisdom traditions about mind wandering and about mind focusing and about techniques or about what that means and all this kind of stuff. So, to what extent, did that kind of drive your kind of internal curiosity and then bringing that into the laboratory like you like to do and from a science from a scientific perspective how much did you lean on what you know meditators have been saying for hundreds if not thousands of years about this mind wandering thing yeah i leaned on it very much so the so the tech, the book has two parts you know one of the part is more the theory and the neuroscience and then the, the other part is more about techniques. What can you use to try to uh, decrease your mind wandering? And, you know, it's like we can discuss whether it's good to mind wander or bad to mind wander. You know, it's like there's debates whether, you know, uh, whether it's necessary or not. What's interesting is that if you ask expert uh, meditators, people who meditate, like sometimes do free or retreats, they still mind wander uh, in their meditation, so they can't stop uh, the, the wandering mind. And so the practical part, to come back to your question, is very much anchored into, yeah, Eastern tradition of uh, meditation and meditation technique, and the ones which were adapted to the West mindfulness and other techniques uh, I've experienced myself in my practice. And so uh, I put in the book. You know, I, I think you're touching on something. There's some wonderful adaptation and movement forward that's going on in the Western tradition as it's trying to reimagine and reinterpret. And, and I think in so many ways, really taking the whole topic of consciousness, expanded consciousness and meditation so much further. And, you know, within the non-dual community, I think this is a hot topic that you're bringing up of what is really the purpose of meditating. And am I missing the point when I'm trying to enter into that expanded state 
when instead of realizing, you know, kind of, and it gets very Buddhist that I'm always there and that even the thought of trying to will myself to be in a different state might be missing the point. I was just listening to Eckhart Tolle, and I think he has been making that point more lately. And of course, he's kind of one of the leading voices yep. in, in a lot of this stuff. So what, what are some of your thoughts on what you touched on to focus or not to focus? That is the question. To wander or not wander? Wander or not wander? Well, you don't really have the choice. You have to wander. But, uh, you know, that reminds me, so uh, I'm a Zen practitioner, and uh, about 15 years ago, I was on this trip to India. I did a lot of my research in India with uh, expert meditators, uh, and so I was at this ashram with a, a friend of mine, and we were we're doing this, uh, um, uh, it was in the, you know, Vivekananda and Ramakrishna uh, um, um uh, following and so we were doing this ceremony, and and this teacher, uh, you know, at the end came, so there was a lot of chanting, very very different from Zen, and the teacher came at me at the end and asked me how you know how was it for you? It's like you know you're probably not used to that, you know how was it? And uh, I was like, it felt very much like my meditation. You know, sometimes your mind is engaged totally. You know, it's like in the chanting, and then sometimes you're just thinking about other things. And uh, he smiled. I don't know if he agreed or not, but for me, I took that, uh, um, yeah, as an agreement that, yeah, we experience that in many, you know, different tradition meditations. So it's not specific to one meditation tradition, and it is also central to you know our meditation. Not only uh, we do it all the time in our meditation, but also we judge ourselves. Uh, you know, as you said, I mean, at least as you know, for me. Like a good meditation is one where I didn't mind wander too much. You know, I was concentrated, I was focused, and uh, you know, ones where my mind was all over and I was thinking about all these things I have to do is not a very good meditation. And um, and even though you know, in the Zen tradition which I follow, you're supposed not to judge yourself. You know, you're like don't judge yourself, but you can't help it. And so I also want to mention. Uh, so I did different traditions, but, you know, one of them is uh, transcendental, uh, meditation. I was lucky to be trained in this technique as well. And in these techniques, mind wandering is seen very differently. Mind wandering is seen as thoughts bubbling up, you know, to the surface. So it's actually a good thing to, uh, mind wander in this tradition, which helps because you don't judge yourself as much. You have a lot of mind wandering and then you're like, oh, I had the good meditation session lots of fault bubbled up lots of energy was released and um yeah so it's also a difference of you know perspective uh, help to not judge yourself too much as your mind wandering of course all this discussion folds back into the fundamental question about the nature of consciousness yeah and i've i've heard you address that and i listened to a youtube talk that you just gave uh Tell us where you stand on that. I mean, obviously, every, this whole conversation we're having presupposes fundamentally um, a post-materialistic, post-physicalist understanding of consciousness. Tell us, where, you're also in the neuroscience world. You can't walk through the hallways of, you know, Cal San Diego and kind of uh, just proudly say, of course, that's all baloney. Uh, how do you work those two worlds? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, what you're touching on. So I'm, uh, you know, minor, one of the minority of scientists, uh, we just published this paper. What if consciousness, you know, in, is more than the brain? And, uh, we got a lot of interest in that mainstream paper. And, um, yeah, the, the idea is that, you know, I start from the hypothesis, mostly based on my, uh, practice and also, you know, my intuition that, I cannot be reduced to, um, you know, just a bunch of uh, dead matter, as, you know, Francis Crick uh, would say. And that's also based on some thoughts experiments, which are not necessarily new. But uh, if you imagine you have a very fast camera, you know, that can film uh, down to attoseconds, I don't know, 10 to the minus 15, or no, no, 10 to the minus 18 or something seconds. 
I'm probably wrong in there in the units, but you know, very, very fast. And you can see every single uh, molecular reaction in the brain because you know we know how the neuron works and we know how they transmit information, etc. So we have a lot of understanding how this machinery work, uh, uh, biochemical machinery. So let's say we can see everything. We can see slow motions, everything that happens. And, you know, where's consciousness there? You know, it's just like, do you just speed up the movie and now consciousness emerge magically? Uh, I personally find it hard to believe. So I believe there is, you know, something more uh, to consciousness than just the emergence from speeding up the movie of biochemical uh, uh, reaction. So that's an hypothesis, you know, and that's, you know, uh, I've done many experiments to try to, uh, yeah, prove or, you know, disprove uh, the hypothesis that consciousness is more than the brain. And in some way, you know, consciousness uh, might be fundamental, you know, a force in the universe, like the other forces, you know, the strong force, um, weak force and electromagnetic force. You know, the thing that kept going through my mind as I was kind of listening to your presentation, because I've been doing this show and on this topic for a long time, is how we just remain stuck in it. It, it just seems silly. It seems ridiculous. Of course, I mean, the emergence of consciousness from the brain has never been proven. There's no empirical data for it. And on the contrary, you know, it's not like uh, we haven't presented mind manner interactions right there at IANS. I mean, Dean Radin has Six Sigma results of presentiment experiments that completely shatter the materialistic paradigm. They can't be incorporated into the materialistic paradigm with its relationship to time or causation. You know, that's all kind of out the window. I guess I get a little bit frustrated that we even give any weight to it. We understand why it's been around. We understand that shut up and calculate kind of keeps the engines of our society working. But from a really from a philosophical and scientific basis, you know, Max Planck 100 years ago, consciousness is fundamental, is is the paradigm that is the best fit for the data, is it not? Yeah. And I mean, the, I think, you know, one of the issues we still have in the field is, you know, the lack of model, you know, how does consciousness interact with matter? Um, you know, you can say consciousness is fundamental, but, you know, we still have to figure out how it interacts, you know, with, you know, the uh, physics we know, you know, how does it integrate into the physics? So I just work on this and uh, actually we, uh, we're organizing this price at IONS, you know, for any experimental idea that, you know, consciousness is more than the brain. So we got three winners last year and then we were doing another contest this year. But, you know, one of them was Don Hoffman with this, uh, what you might have had on your show, with his conscious agents, you know, where uh, consciousness is fundamental and then you build you know, the uh, break of, you can build quantum mechanic from these conscious agents. So that's one model, but still this model has problem uh, because, you know, where is subjectivity in that model? It's just a mathematical model. So there's still lots, lots to do. There's lots to do, but back to, I guess, where I was before, the, the other side hasn't done their part. I mean, they haven't offered any empirical data showing how consciousness can emerge from matter. That there's none, there's zero. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, there's all sorts of data of mind manner interactions. You might, we mentioned uh, Raiden in the presentiment, which is just it's replicated now, you know, 40 times in his lab and in other labs around the world, Six Sigma result. He's got the Global Consciousness Project, another Six Sigma result. You got Mossbridge, another uh, person from IONS. I mean, you have all these seminal kind of parapsychology experiments that rather kind of conclusively present solid data that just shatters the existing paradigm. So I don't know why we feel a need to, uh, to prove. Uh, it seems like the burden of proof has shifted to the other side where they have to either, they have to provide the model for how that data, the good data that we have could be incorporated in. And if we keep kind of coming from the position that let us prove it to you, I mean, they'll just do the same thing that they've always done, which is just say that's that's not enough. We need more. We're the we're the dominant paradigm. That's not scientific to say we're the dominant paradigm. That's not even, you know, that's the one funeral at a time thing. So, 
I, I, I just, I don't know. I, I think we need a different way to, to kind of leap forward past that. Um, I mean, I believe, you know, scientists are about data, you know, it's like, and the data, you know, you just have to keep on publishing and keep on showing data. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not of the camp and I don't think Dean would be in this camp. He is continuing to do experiments as well. So he's not stopping to do experiments. And I've published many paper with Dean and Julia. Uh, and yeah, so I don't think, you know, from our perspective, you know, it is fully demonstrated, you know, there's still issues of reproducibility, uh, you know, which are, you know, uh, uh, addressed and, and, uh, 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 von Luca do, for example, you know, experiments, which you might have heard of, but, um, yeah, it's not without necessary problems or we've demonstrated there's nothing to be done anymore. Um, you know, first, you know, one experiment isolated doesn't demonstrate anything it has to be reproduced independently by different labs. And then, um, you know, in this field, we're also lucky that, uh, at least for me, you know, this has improved the methodology I used just because I want to know for myself. So I'm going to use the best statistics. And also, uh, whenever I publish a paper, uh, for example, I release the data so other people can have access to the data. So I think it's a long process. And also, you don't want to rush it. You know, you don't want to, uh, and you want other people to reproduce it. And, and then, yeah, scientists, you know, believe in data. And there is this one funeral, one funeral at a time you mentioned, you know, it's like uh, the old scientists are, you know, are, are, are dragging down the whole community because we're holding on to their beliefs. And uh, this happens. But I, I have trust in science. And, and but scientists are more about data than their own belief, at least the true scientist. And that, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the proof of the data, it's never a proof, but, you know, the proof beyond reasonable doubt of the data, uh, we all prevail, whatever it comes out to be. Yeah, I, I <laughs> we, we won't drag that on too too long. Uh, you know, Max Planck, 100 years ago, he was the king of the heap when it came to physicists, right? So Einstein kind of sat at his feet and threw parties for him, saying what he was, what a great physicist he was and how he was the best, till World War II kind of created a little rift. But other than that, you know, it wasn't like he was a philosopher sitting back with his pipe in his mouth when he says, I regard consciousness as fundamental. That was his experimental conclusion from looking at light and looking at the observer effect and looking what everyone else was doing. So the idea that a hundred years ago, the best science we had, the best physics we had suggested that, and now we should wait longer. You know, And Dean Radin may be continuing to do that research, but you know, the last time I talked to him, other than his peculiar transhumanist kind of tendencies, I mean, he seems pretty frustrated with the fact that he has conclusively proven this, if you will, beyond what is normally accepted uh, as, as necessary. You know, how many replications do you need to do? How many people achieve a Six Sigma result in these kind of human-machine interactions? I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Anyways. There's so many other things to talk about. One of the things I'm super interested in lately is artificial intelligence. And I stumbled across, and this is on your IONS website, mm -hmm. and the blog post is Artificial Intelligence and Consciousness. So in this blog post, it was more to uh, the type of int intelligence, artificial intelligence we're doing, like ChatGPT. It's still very mechanical, you know, even though people don't really understand what's going on in these models, they're still run on computers. There is a lot of intelligence in this network, but I don't think there is much uh, consciousness. Now, it doesn't mean that they can't be conscious. They can't be conscious. I believe, uh, for example, you know, in the uh, Francisco Varela, so Francisco, you know, was a well-known neuroscientist that passed about 15 years ago, and he created the Mind and Life Institute uh, together with Richard Davidson. But he had this uh, hypothesis, you know, of autopoietic uh, systems. And autopoietic systems is just that a system is defined by its function rather than its parts. That's why you can do artificial heart. 
And uh, that's why you could do artificial brain. And I also believe that um, if the brain, now that's more of, you know, hypothesis, but, you know, if you consciousness, if you consider consciousness as a force or a field of nature, you can imagine that the brain is like a, a particle accelerator, you know, that's like a, a fusion reactor that maintains this field of consciousness. And there's no reason why, you know, it should be the brain or, you know, some other uh, construct that fulfills the same function. So I do believe, you know, that consciousness is not limited to uh, humans. You know, you have animals, but even, you know, you could have completely different, like a silicon brain. But the type of intelligence, artificial intelligence we're seeing today is not there at all. It's, it's just still very mechanical and predictive uh, to, to some extent. So that's what was the uh, blog was about. Now, it doesn't mean that artificial intelligence won't bring us closer to that goal. Uh, mostly because artificial intelligence is going to accelerate everything. Uh, you know, accelerate science, accelerate, unfortunately, wars, uh, accelerates, you know, uh, human evolution to a uh, degree. I think we we don't really realize, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, the singularity might be near because of artificial intelligence and the way, you know, things are uh, are speeding up. So it will bring us closer to uh, artificial intelligence being conscious, but right now, yeah, it's not. Yeah, there are so many points that I'd pick on there. I mean, first off, you know, I've done a lot of uh, research. I used to be in AI a long, long time ago. I was in my PhD program studying artificial intelligence. I started an AI company back when expert systems were hot and going. So I've always had a, had an interest in the field and stayed on top of it and was never a big believer until lately. And now, the, what they've done and the technology behind uh, this, which a lot of people I don't think are aware of, I, I think it's much more powerful than many people realize because they see the front facing AI and they see, you know, image generation where there's six fingers on the hand, or the hand is or the face is distorted and stuff like that. And they don't see what's going on. I mean, yes, machine learning is so much more advanced than you really even know at this point because every day they're making new advances. But it, do you, are you familiar with the kind of uh, bootstrapping idea with AI that really what we're seeing right now is us feeding the data to AI, the next level of really explosion in growth is when AI generates synthetic data. And then the iterative power of that is kind of unimaginable. So yeah. I wonder if we're not a lot closer to this edge than we thought. And then let's come back after that and talk about sentience. Because what I think, I think Max Planck is right. And I think by definition, that means that AI can never be sentient because all matter is derived from consciousness. Consciousness is fundamental. So a silicon chip, by definition, can never be sentient because it is derived from matter. It's the wrong way around in the equation. Okay, two huge points there to kind of, we can wrestle to the ground. Yeah, and have a I mean, I'm, I, I'm aligned with you. I mean, I do believe, you know, silicon can become sentient. If you have, you know, if you implement, you know, the way humans are sentient, you can do it in silicon. Doesn't matter if it's in cells or silicon, as long as it fulfills the same function. So it's the same autopoietic idea of viola. But, you know, what matters is the function more than the substrates on which it's uh, based. So, uh, you know, the, the brain, you know, is, de you know, is designed in a specific way and it has, you know, specific functions that is, you know, able to, channel consciousness and uh you know in my uh worldview um yeah consciousness is fundamental and there's no reason why uh city wouldn't be able to do that now in terms of the performance of ai i i personally you know believe ai you know will not only accelerate everything but it is also you know, a threat to humanity because you can totally Im imagine yeah ai taking over the world and it doesn't have to be sentient it just can be completely, you know, it's like it just has this, you know, it's optimizing this function and, and you know, human programmed it, but, you know, he optimized uh, human uh, uh, 
human optimized AI to guarantee human survival, for example. But the AI decides that the best way to, you know, to make humans survive is to park them and in prisons. And, and so, you know, it's totally imaginable that, uh, yeah, AI could potentially, you know, take over the world, probably not in 10 years, you know, maybe in a hundred without being sentient. It's just optimizing uh, this, this function that has been programmed into it, which is uh, number one, to survive. And number two, to help human, but, you know, it got, uh, it got sidetracked because, you know, it wasn't programmed in the same way. And that's the main issue in AI is the alignment problem. You know, it's like you want the AI to do something, but, you know, it will find a way to uh, do it, you know, simpler and, and maybe bypass what you really wanted it to do. And it's very hard to explain it. I want you to do this, but not this, but not this, but this, et cetera. Yeah. I have a bunch of thoughts on that, but I want to return to the function thing mm -hmm. as, you know, the Turing test that you're kind of saying, you're, you're really kind of restating the Turing test. It's, it's function. If it fools you into thinking it's sentient, it's sentient. And that's why I think really the work that you are doing and so many other of your colleagues are doing, like we can talk about your mediumship research in a while. Well, what I think you're doing is redefining the Turing test. Because I would suggest that now sentience has to include that ability to look at those images and make that judgment. And now I think that puts everyone like, well, no, it could never do that. The AI must do as well or better than humans do in the presentiment experiment. Have to. If that's, if that's part of our consciousness, then we can just look at it from a functional standpoint if you want. I think what it suggests is a deeper reality that we are in consciousness rather than, and that consciousness is this largely expanded realms and realms that you explore in your meditation and all the wisdom traditions tell us they are. I think that is the most parsimonious explanation for the data. But even if you just want to stay nerdy, neuroscience, uh, UCSD, you still got to say, Okay, sit down, chatbot. You got to do uh, Arno's uh, medium experiment, and you got to do the presentiment experiment. And until you can do those, you're not sentient. What do you think about that? Yeah, oh, I mean, I agree in principle. Now, you know, like when we test subjects, uh, you know, there's some who can do it, some who cannot. And then we do statistics, you know, across many people, and we show on average people can do it. But you know, if I uh, if I use that as a test or sentience, yeah, you're going to say a lot of humans are not sentient. So I don't think it's necessarily, you know, the best uh, test. I had this idea of uh, the, you know, the uh, oneness Turing test where, uh, I mean, you had these uh, Google engineer who believed, uh, you know, the AI was sentient. Uh, I can't remember his name, uh, but um, yeah, a little bit like this, you know, if, enough humans, you know, consider, you know, that their own, you know, that the life of AI is more valuable or as valuable as the life of their child, uh, you know, that would be, from my perspective, you know, one of the Turing tests you can do that humans are convinced, you know, that it is sentience and they're convinced enough that it is sentience, sentient to, uh, and they can be confused. But, you know, if the humanity is convinced that AI is sentient, for me, uh, uh, for this specific test, AI is sentient. And, uh, and the way you can demonstrate, you know, if, uh, if it's convinced or not is by doing this kind of test, you know, where do you put, you know, would you turn off with AI? Do you think that's cruel? Uh, you know, where, you know, between this AI and, you know, this child, et cetera, you know, would you put first, et cetera, seeing how people attribute uh, not only agency, but sentience to, uh, to, to that AI and, you know, how humanity treats it. So that's the, yeah, the oneness uh, Turing test. Okay. Since I brought it up a couple of times and I never really gave you a chance to explain, I think a lot of people find it just fascinating. Tell folks about your mediumship experiment yes. and how it is. I, I read a little blurb how it's like one of the most highly 
kind of read or noticed uh, articles on ResearchGate, which you had an interesting comment. You know, everyone says they're not interested in the stuff. They don't take it seriously, but they do. So yeah, the mediumship experiment uh, is, you know, is from the assumption that consciousness is fundamental. Now, how do you show that consciousness is fundamental? So you have different branches. You know, consciousness can be uh, fundamental, but you know, it cannot interact with the physical world. So, you know, it just has, um, so you can actually never show that consciousness is fundamental. It's just a, a, a epiphenomenon. And I think that's where most scientists, uh, you know, neuroscientists, like at least 70% stand is like, okay, consciousness, qualia exist, but you know, it Maybe can, down it, at these little microtubules, I'll, I'll, I can accept that. I can live with that. Just don't yeah, bring it into my life. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, well, it's also that you know, uh, illusion is free will. Uh, uh, the free will is illusion. Uh, I think that's uh, where most uh, neuroscientists would stand. That you know, consciousness qualia exists, but it doesn't have any functional role in in the world. You can't influence anything with your consciousness. You just happen to be conscious, and you have no free will. Uh, um, and I would say, you know, 70% of scientists uh, um, are in that camp. And then the other uh, camp is, uh, well, you also have the materialist reductionist, which would be, I think right now, a minority, you know, compared to these scientists who believe consciousness exists. And then you have, uh, you know, the scientists like me who believe consciousness is fundamental. And then when you have consciousness as fundamental, you have, you know, again, two possibilities. Consciousness is fundamental, but, you know, it is still contained within the brain somehow. So it can't have any effect, uh, you know, outside uh, the brain. And then you have, uh, you know, the other hypothesis, but, you know, consciousness can have uh, uh, an effect outside the brain. And that's based on, you know, the fact that if consciousness is a field, like the electromagnetic field, you know, it extends to infinity. So there's no reason, you know, why it should stop. Uh, uh, at the brain. And so if consciousness is fundamental and can have an effect outside the brain, how do we test that? So that's the experiments, mind matter you've been mentioning. Mind matter is actually much harder to study than uh, telepathy, for example. So if you look at the literature, there is many more reports of telepathy, even spontaneous report of telepathy. The person who invented the brainwave, uh, Hans Berger, I think in 1923, about 100 years ago, did that because he had a telepathy experience with his sister. Uh, and, you know, we have all these reports of, you know, twin experiencing each other's feelings, even at a distance. So that's a much more common than, you know, people influencing electrons on, on, on the bench. It's also much easier to study. And so that's why I was interested in mediumship. So mediumship, so you have psychics, you know, who try to predict the future. And then you have mediums who claim they're in contact with your deceased relative. And when they claim they're in contact with your deceased relative, they just want to bring you proof. They want to convince you that's the case. So they're going to say, oh, yeah, they like this, they like that, etc." And here, the idea is that I wasn't testing whether they were in contact with deceased relative. It could have been telepathy with a client. I was just testing whether there was some abnormal information. They were access. They were having access to that they should not have access to, based on, um, you know, the mainstream view that uh, these phenomena don't exist. So it could have been telepathy. Uh, it could have been something else. Here I was in testing that I was doing a double blind experiments with mediums, where we just um, gave them a name. So for example, we will ask the medium. Okay, tell us something about John. So I would ask the medium, tell us something about John. And we had somebody that wanted a reading about John, but I don't know that person. That's why it's double blind. The only thing I know is somebody wants a reading about John and my colleague, you know, contacted that person that wants a reading about John and told them, somebody's going to do a reading about John at about that time. And then I have another person, you know, that wants a reading about Robert. And so I asked the medium, okay, now you've given up a reading about John, give me a reading about Robert. And so, you know, they tell me, so we have them 20 questions, you know, what's their hobbies and, you know, what's their, uh, how did they pass? What's their, uh, you know, body, you know, uh, characteristics. And, um, 
you know, and, you know, that's uh, another one of them. So I can talk about one, uh, this one later. But the previous, the first experiment is that's what we did. And the idea is, um, now I have two readings about one about John, one about Robert, and I'm going to send both of these to the person that wanted the reading about John and the person that wanted to reading about Robert. And of course I removed the name. So they don't know which one it is. And they have to tell us, okay, I think that was reading for me, or I think this was the reading for me. And they also rate each questions independently. And when we did that, uh, we did find, um, what we had, you know, uh, above chance expectation that the medium would be correct. And so that was one experiment. The one you just showed, uh, was, uh, the, the issue of doing this experiment is very heavy. You know, we have to talk to the people who want to reading. We have to communicate with them uh, and, you know, send them their response. And when we were with the medium, they say, oh, yeah, sometimes I see a picture and I know what happened to that person. I know how they died, etc. So we did this specific experiment where we had 200 pictures of uh, individual um and these were people who died, you know, in different circumstances. It could be death by firearm. It could be a, a car accident, or it could be a heart attack. And we had mediums in front of the computer screen. And they just had to press a button, just looking at the picture for about 10 seconds and say, I think this person died of a heart attack, or I think this person died of a um, car accident, or I think this person died by firearm. So that's why you just showed these pictures. And uh, of course, we spent a lot of time trying to balance. So, uh, you know, we have about 200 uh, images and a one third is of one type. So one third of car accidents, one third of heart attack, one third of death by firearm. And we tried to balance. So there's no more people smiling, you know, in one category, no more female than male, no more uh, people were obese in the heart attack category, of course. And so we balance all the image. So that takes a lot of time. But once we have the image, we can have the mediums in front of a computer screen trying to select uh, uh, the button. And, um, you know, of course, we respect, you know, people who have passed. We use, uh, you know, public uh, pictures. And, um, and the result we found was that, um, yeah, when we took 10, I think we had 10 mediums and 10 controls. When we took everybody, um, we had results which were above chance expectations. So people were able to guess, in quotes, you know, whether uh, the person died of a heart attack or they died by firearm or they died by a car accident. So yeah, that's a, this plot. So chance is at 33% because there's three categories of image. And you can see there is more bars above than uh, below the line. And it's not like, yeah, they're going to guess 100%. It's more like they're going to guess 35 instead of 33. But we have so many images. But this 35 is actually very what we call significant. It's very unlikely to happen uh, by chance. Here we have uh, odds against chance of uh, 1 in, in 41. So it means there's like very little chance it happens by chance. Now, you know, does it mean uh, it's real? Or can they use other methods? It's not ruled out. Like, for example, you look, it's been shown, you know, if you look at an image of someone smoking and someone not smoking, you can detect, you know, which one are smoking. So maybe it's written on their face <laughs> somehow, but, you know, they're going to die of a heart attack or they're, you know, they have like, uh, they look, uh, you know, maybe a bit more impulsive and, you know, they're more likely to die, uh, 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 you know, in the, by firearm. So. Yeah, you know, it's there's still. Yeah, but let's not even go there with all that apologistic uh, skeptical Oh, no, it's, it's not apologistic. It's extremely important. That's the controls. You know, if it you. It's the never, control. But at some to, point, well, again, you got to so, close all the loopholes. Yeah. Right. And then once you close all the loopholes, then what? So, you know, the whole field of uh, after death communication, and there's multiple forms of after death communication, right? There's mediumship, there's also spontaneous, there's induced after death communication. You know, the people from University of North Texas, uh, Dr. Janice Holden has done all sorts of work in inducing this. 60% of people who are long time married for a long time lose a spouse, report 
uh, after death communication. There's all sorts of ways to verify that data too. I mean, I think the the reality of after death communication is more or less established. I think it's fantastic that you did uh, this research and great more. Let's give you another hundred million dollars to go do another, but you're all for it. Another, because uh, there's no money in, in this kind of research, but you know, all, all for it. Right. But mm -hmm. The the point being, I I I do want to say it's fantastic. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. Julie Bischel from Winbridge? Do you of course, know yeah, we did some studies together. Yeah, great. So she's been doing this for a long time. Comes to the same conclusion, no matter how you slice it. After death communication is real. Now I want to pin you back to this other thing. The new Turing test must include this, right? Because what what you said is, hey, you know, just not everyone has this capability so we can't incorporate it into a Turing test. Well, it's not everyone can do uh, graduate level calculus, but we don't say you're not sentient if you can't do it or any other field of study. If this is a part of the human experience, then why shouldn't that become part of what we consider to be sentient? I think we're just on the cusp of being there and saying, Okay, these, you know, you go go to India, right? And all those people would say, of course, this is part of your of your nature is to have these capabilities. Why wouldn't we inc incorporate those into? I'm still pitching. Why would yeah, we well, incorporate those? Can into? incorporate them. Yeah. If you want to, you can incorporate them. All right, you're not going to stop me. Up to so. <laughs> no, great, great. It won't, so, it won't hurt to incorporate them. Yeah. Right. Right. I hear you. Okay, so um, what else do we really need to talk about, uh, particularly with regard to the book and with regard to your research at uh, University of California, San Diego? What is kind of most on your mind right now to kind of turn it back to the, the book in your mind and where your mind is wandering? Yeah, and so in the, in the book, uh, you know, there's also this section, you know, where do thoughts come from and, you know, and the idea of it could potentially come from outside the brain. So, you know, you have different thoughts, you know, thoughts which are related to yourself and thoughts, you know, which are like the mediums, you know, when they have uh, the, when they have experience, you know, they experience it as spots. Where do these thoughts come from? So it's also, you know, leaving the door open to, yeah, thoughts not coming uh, from the brain and uh, consciousness being fundamental. And, um, yeah, so where, you know, what else, well, uh, what else, uh, are, are we doing? So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all these experiments, all these experiments on consciousness being fundamental. Also at uh, UC, uh, San Diego, I'm studying AI and brain waves. So more building what, uh, uh, um, you know, large models based on lots of data to process uh, brainwaves and lead to the yeah, future uh, discoveries. I do believe, you know, AI will accelerate sciences in all realms. So it's not only whether AI is sentient, but also using AI as a tool to uh, accelerate discovery in science and understand better how the brain works. Where do you come down on the big spiritual questions? Who am I? Why am I here? Are those topics you even think are approachable from either your personal experience as a meditator or your spiritual experience? I don't know if you've had any spiritually transformative experiences. So that's why I got into science, actually. I was in sixth grade and uh, I'm from France. So I was in the suburbs of Paris in the courtyard at school. And, you know, and I didn't know what I wanted to be, of course, you know, being 12. And uh, the thoughts struck me. I want to know why I'm here. And so that's why, you know, in my upbringing, if you want to know why you're here and you're in, you know, Western country, that means you got to study the brain. And so that's what I did until I realized science can just tell you how things work. You know, it will, it will never tell you why. And, and that's just not the goal of science. Science is a method. You just use it as a method so you can test anything you want. From my perspective, there is no pseudoscience. There's only bad science. Bad science is when you don't use the appropriate statistics and you don't design your experiment uh, uh, in a way that is rigorous enough to you know, address your hypothesis. So um, 
So that's where I transitioned, you know, about 20 years ago to, you know, studying more, uh, you know, fringe topics using the tools of science because, yeah, science doesn't care what you study. But what are you doing with the near-death experience science then? How are you incorporating that into your worldview? And, and I guess for me, you know, the question is, at what point do we say, okay, that data is good enough. Now we have to start taking serious the accounts and start incorporating those in as well. Because there seems to be this kind of forced bifurcation within materialistic science where we can kind of push against it, you know, so long. And they keep pushing back, pushing back. And we get blogged up in kind of, quote unquote, proving it which is not the job of science, I don't think. I think the job is to put forth the most parsimonious explanation for the data and say, that's where we're at. We're never going to prove anything. So what are you doing with the near-death experience data? And at what point do we start looking at those accounts and taking them seriously? Because there's a treasure trove of potentially understanding we could have about what is in these extended consciousness realms. Yeah, so near-death experience, uh, it's it's very hard to study. I even studied myself near-death near experience, even though I have colleagues who've done that, you know, in the ICU. Uh, but um, so, yeah, near-death experience is uh, when you see the light, basically. You know, your heart stops, you see the light, then you come back to tell your story. But in, in a lot of near-death experience, you have OBE, out-of-body experiences. And these ones we're trying to study because uh, first there's some individual who's claim they can do out-of-body experience at will. Yeah, so we can, you know, you can potentially study these people. And also we have uh, designed VR paradigms where, uh, so virtual reality paradigm, where we're trying to induce out-of-body experiments, out-of-body experience. So that's one of the area of research uh, we're pursuing, because once you create out of body experience, so we had this other paper uh, where we ask, we ask, uh, I think 100, 100, 150 scientists, what would be the most convincing uh, results for you, uh, you know, in in uh, psi experiments that would convince you, and they'd say, well, if if out of body uh, experience can can, for example, experience some object that they're not supposed to. For example, they get out of body and they can read something that they're not supposed to see from their uh, vantage point. You know, that would be convincing uh, to these uh, scientists, which were all skeptical, as scientists and engineers. And uh, so, you know, that's one of our area of research where we're trying to induce out of body experience and see if people can experience uh, you know, through their senses, things that were, you know, from their vantage point, they're not supposed to experience like sound in a different room or, you know, image uh, hidden somewhere. Excellent. That sounds absolutely uh, fantastic. So our guest today has been Arnaud Delorme. And uh, the, the book that you're going to want to check out, let's bring that up one more time. Why Our Minds Wander, Understand the Science and Learn How to Focus Your Thoughts. But please also visit his Ion's page. There's so much more to this fantastic research that he's doing. And he was nice enough to share just some of the things that he's into. And every time he brings up a new topic, you just realize how incredibly transformative that can be for science. I mean, this latest thing, he just goes, oh yeah, out-of-body experience, we're doing that too. And here's how we're going to do it. And mediumship, of course, we got that covered. So a lot going on and it's fantastic that he's pushing it forward and, and being so successful with it because you are gaining a lot of attention and traction. So that's to your credit. Uh, thanks again. Where, where do you think see things going and, and what is the best way for people to kind of join in your world and see what's going on with your work? Yeah. So on the, on the mind wandering, uh, people can go and meditation, you know, people can go to my webpage on the lawn.com. And then for all the experiments, um, all the fringe experiments on mediumships, out of body experience. Uh, it's more the IONS website. So IONS.org. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Delorme, it's been absolutely great having you on. And thanks again for taking this time with us. Well, thank you for having me.